Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. And we have a ready reception for your word, ready to receive what's offered to us. We're going to take hold of it and we're going to apply it in our life. And we thank you for all that you bring forth through it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. We've sh been sharing with you on the subject of God's covenant of holiness and the cleansing process to holiness and the spiritual washing of the body of Christ. And we're going to continue somewhat on that line, but from a different aspect. Because God wants us to realize that if we're going to possess the promises, the promised land, we're going to have to walk in holiness and walk in His ways. Well, today we're going to talk on the subject of being tested, proved, and prepared in your spiritual wilderness. We must understand that when you are born again and you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have received a brand new spirit, you're not under Satan's authority any longer, and you've come out of bondage to the world. In Scripture, Pharaoh is a type of Satan. Egypt is a type of the world. The exodus out of Egypt where they ate the lamb is a type of us receiving Jesus, the real lamb, when we get born again. Well, after they came out of Egypt, Egypt being a type of the world, they were being led through the wilderness. And we see in Amos 2.10, he says, Also, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Notice, he didn't lead him in the wilderness to stay there in the wilderness, but to go through the wilderness. There was no way into the promised land except for through the wilderness. You have to go through the wilderness because the wilderness is the place of where there's testing, there are trials, there's going to be a finding out of what really is in you, whether you're going to walk in God's ways or not. And also the enemy is there, of course, to try to bring destruction against you. And it's going to find out whether you're going to walk in God's ways and be prepared and be able to enter into what God has for you. It is a time of testing and preparation, and every one of us will go through those tests. There's no quick jump from, from coming out of Egypt into the promised land. No, you're going to go through your spiritual wilderness, and we want to pass the tests. Now, over in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 10, we see something that's very important, beginning here in verse 5. He says, with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. God didn't want them to be overthrown in the wilderness. He wanted them to go through the wilderness to enter into the land. The physical promised land is a type of the spiritual promised land, which are the promises of God that you are to possess in your life. Well, they got overthrown in the wilderness. God is not well pleased concerning anybody that gets overwhelmed in the wilderness. He doesn't want you to get overwhelmed. And your spiritual wilderness is the walk that you are going through as you are going to possess the promises in your life. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Here they came out of Egypt, but they continued to lust after evil things instead of following the way of the Lord. He said, neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They were serving self, doing what they wanted to do. We cannot have any idolatry in our life. We must be those that are going to put the Lord first place, and we must deny self, and we must walk in the ways of the Word of God. Neither let us commit fornication. As some of them committed, fell in one day, three and 20,000. 23,000 were killed, they died, they were judged because of fornication. We cannot be involved in fornication. If you ever were, you confess the sin, you receive forgiveness, cleansing from all unrighteousness, and you repent and turn away and never let fornication ever be involved in you in your life. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. They tempted Christ when they would draw back. They tempted Christ when they would not obey Him. They tempted Christ when they, they were following after their lusts instead of doing the things that God wanted them to do. And they got destroyed of the enemy, which is serpents are a type of the evil spirits. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. We can't murmur. Murmuring all is coming out of self, but I don't like what's happening because of self. They were murmuring and complaining and griping over things instead of realizing what God was doing in their life to bring forth his preparation and his, his character in their life so that they could enter in to what God had for them. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. They're written for our admonition, admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Otherwise, these examples are important for us because the tests that came to them, we're going to have the same kind of tests. We've got to pass the tests. 
instead of falling and allowing ourselves to be overthrown in the wilderness. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You always got to be on guard. If you think you're above the ability to fall, you're kidding yourself. Anybody could fall. We got to guard ourselves, take heed, so we never give place to the enemy and fall. Now, in the wilderness, as he was leading them, they had to learn to trust God and be totally dependent upon him. This is what God is wanting to work in your life. He wants you to learn that you must trust in the Lord and look to him as your total source of all things. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, in verse 7, the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Forty, by the way, in Scripture, the number forty is the number of testing, showing that this time in the wilderness is a time of spiritual testing. Notice the Lord has been with them. The Lord doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He's with us. And he says, Thou hast lacked nothing. That means he supplied every need. He met every need in their life. You've got to know that the Lord, He will never leave you, He will never forsake you, He will meet every need. You've got to rely on Him. And you've got to learn to trust the Lord. Trust in Him with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Not acknowledge Him in all your ways. He will direct your paths. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, we see in verse 1, All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. He wants you to possess the land. By the way, the word possess means to, to possess something in the Strong's, it says, occupy by driving out previous inhabitants. So you're going to seize it and take possession of it because you are going to have to confront the enemies that are in the land because all the enemies were there and they couldn't possess the land without driving them out. We must keep the commandments of the Lord. And he says, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. You're supposed to learn and remember these things so that you take heed to all the principles that get established in you so you walk in them and they become your life that you're going to do the word. And notice he says, as the Lord led thee these 40 years, the number of tests in, in the wilderness, to humble you. God is going to humble you. Pride has to be dealt with in every person's life. We cannot have pride. Pride goes before a fall. God resists the proud, but he gives grace, his favor to the humble. See, favor doesn't automatic, grace doesn't automatically come to everybody just because you're born again. If you walk in pride, you're going to be resisted. But if you are humble, then you will see God's favor as grace in your life. He not only came to humble them, but also to prove them, to test them, to find out what was in their heart and whether they would keep his commandments or not. God's going to find out what's in your heart by your walk, by what you do. Don't be those kind of Christians, and I've heard them for years, that say, well, God knows what's in my heart, even though they're not walking in line with the Word of God, thinking that they can justify themselves before God. God still knows what's in my heart. I have a good heart for God, even though I'm not doing His Word. No. How does He find out what's in your heart? By what you do. Your talk is cheap. You can say whatever you want. It's shown by your fruit. How do we know them? By their fruits. To know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep His commandments or not. Verse 3. He humbled thee, suffered thee to hunger, fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, not just by physical food, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. When you're in the wilderness, a spiritual wilderness, you're learning to understand that you live by the word of God. You don't just go to the word of God when I have a need. And go, God, I want you to do such and such for me. No, you live by the Word. This is your life. This is what you walk by. This is what you live by. This is what you hear and do and you carry out if you're going to walk in fellowship with Him. And as you do this, you're going to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord. You're going to know Him and you are going to walk in His ways. Even over in Job, we see a statement made in chapter 23, in verse 12. This is what Job said. Neither have I gone back from the commandments, commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Do you esteem the words of his mouth more than your necessary food? I've got to be sure that I get my food so my belly gets full, you know, at desire. Well, how about his word? We are pretty sure that most all of us, on a daily basis, be sure we get our food so that we have the physical food in us. How about the spiritual food? Do you get your daily spiritual food? 
Or are you famished spiritually? Just because you physically feel all right doesn't mean you're spiritually strong. You will only become spiritually strong in the measure that you have the Word of God in you and abiding in you. I have many people that come and they want me to pray for them to have strength. You know, you don't pray for strength. How does strength come? Through the Word in you. You get the Word in it and it produces spiritual strength. So whenever they ask me to pray for strength, I pray for them to get in the Word and hear and do the Word so it produces the spiritual strength in their life because I understand what's going to produce. It's not a matter of just praying, God, give me strength. It's a matter of you hearing and doing the Word that produces the spiritual strength in you. We also see in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 15, he said, Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions. What's that a type of? Evil spirits of every kind. Evil spirits are out there trying to work against you because Satan's the god of this world and he works through the evil spirits that are going to try to work against you to bring destruction. Of course, how do they come in? Through the open door of sin. And do you have them in you? Sure, they've come in from inheritance. We all have them from three generations, three or four generations from inheritance because the iniquity of the fathers are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Inherited generational iniquity curses affect every one of us and those spirits have come in at the time of conception. And they also can come in from our own sins or victimized in life. So we got all these serpents and scorpions that are there. And drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint. Otherwise, the wilderness is also showing you the fact that you're going to have to depend on God. You can't look to the ways of the world. You can't look to your own ways and think that you're going to be able to walk victoriously in life. No, you're going to have to look to the Lord. He fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. God will feed you. He's going to humble you and prove you, find out whether you're really walking with him or not. And what's his purpose? To do you good at thy latter end. Everything that God has for you will always be to bring forth good things in your life. God is a good God. The devil's a bad devil and he's the one that's bringing all the destruction. You've got to realize that all the evil things that are happening, they're not coming from God against you. It's coming from the devil having given place to the enemy in your life. And he will come in and bring destruction. Now, in going out into the wilderness, spiritual wilderness that you and I are walking through to possess the promises land, it is not a place where you were to abide in. In Genesis chapter 20, this is talking about Hagar and Ishmael that were sent out. God was with the lad. He grew and he dwelt in the wilderness became an archer. Are we supposed to dwell in the wilderness? No. We're going through the wilderness. We're not going to get comfortable in the wilderness and stay there. We're going through the wilderness. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Should we take anything out of Egypt that we came out from? No. You don't want to take anything out of Egypt. You only want to take things that God has for you, which is going to be the good things. I find many people have taken things out of Egypt, and they got a problem. I've seen many marriages where one who came out of Egypt but ended up, ended up taking a wife from Egypt because she wasn't born again or a husband that was born, not born again and they wonder why they had all these problems in their marriage because they got unequally yoked. No, you don't want to take anything from the world. You want to only take the things that come from God. You've been delivered out of the world and now we are to walk in His ways. Over in Genesis chapter 37 we see something else. Out in this wilderness, there will be attacks from the enemy. And here is talking about when those brothers threw Joseph into the pit. In Genesis 37, 22, Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that's in the wilderness. Lay no hand upon him, they might rid him out of our hands and deliver him to his father again. In other words, you can be fallen by evil circumstances that try to come against you in your path in the wilderness as you're going on to possess the promises of God. If bad circumstances are coming against you, they're coming from the devil. He's trying to come against you, to stop you, to hinder you, to block you, to bring destruction. Remember, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes that you might have life and life, again, life more abundantly. Now, what will God do? It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. He'll deliver you out of every attack of the enemy. You may have attacks, but you can come out of them. If you'll look to the Lord, 
He will always show you the way. That's why you've got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't get moved by circumstances that come your way. You don't have control over people. People can be used to the devil. Loved ones, husband, wife, children, friends, foes, co-workers, all kinds of people out there that can be destructive influences in your life. Well, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. God will deliver you out of those things, and he will bring you into what he has for you. Now, in Nehemiah, we see in Nehemiah chapter 9, as they're going through the wilderness, entering into the promised land, as they were following through, God was going to find out, remember, whether they would walk in his ways or not. Nehemiah 9, 16, they and our fathers dealt proudly. They hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. Hey, they weren't going to obey. What's going to happen if you don't obey God's word, if you don't hark, hearken unto his commandments? And they hardened their necks against them. They are stubborn and they were prideful. They were resistant. They refused to obey. They weren't even mindful of the wonders that he did among them. But they hardened their necks in their rebellion, appointed a captain to return to their bondage. <laughs> Remember how they always wanted to go back to Egypt. We always want to go back to Egypt. That's the Christian that always wants to go back to the ways of the world instead of depending upon God's Word, trying to do it in his own strength and do what he, he can do himself instead of doing the Word of God and following him. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger of great kindness, and forsook them not. You know, God's not going to forsake you. You turn away from him, you can bring destruction upon yourself, but you know, he's always there after you to try to bring you back to the Lord. He does not forsake us. He's gracious. He's merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness. It says he didn't forsake them whatsoever. Yea, when even they made a molten calf and said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations. They let idols come a hold, get a hold of them. Yet thou and thy manifold mercies forsook them not in the wilderness. One thing you've got to know about, God is always there to bring you out and to bring you, turn things around in your life. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. If you get, get your eyes off of the Lord for a moment, get your eyes back on Him. He will always show you the way to go. He will lead you in the right path. And He's always going to point you. He'll show you the light, which is what? The Word. He's always going to direct you back to the Word, to bring the Word unto you, to show you what to do. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. And withheld not thy manna from their mouth, and gave us them water for their thirst. The Holy Spirit, he's come to instruct us, to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us in what he has for us. Yet forty years did thou sustain them in the wilderness, so they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. You know, if we will walk in his ways, the righteous are never been seen begging bread. No, God will meet every need in their life. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations to divide them into corners. Otherwise, he enabled them to conquer the enemies. So they possessed the land of Sion, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Their children also multiplied. Thou as the stars of heaven brought them into the land, concerning which thou hast promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. So the children went in and possessed the land, and subdued them before the, the inhabitants of the land. The Canaanites gave them into their hands, and their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. They took the strong cities possessed all these things. They became fat and delighted themselves in thy goodness, it talks about. They had all types of tr fruit trees in abundance. They were eaten and filled. Otherwise, God's blessing was upon them as long as they followed him. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and they would rebel against him. You see, you've got to maintain your walk with God. If you turn away and rebel and turn away from his, his word, cast thy law behind their backs, what's that mean? They ignored his word. They quit keeping their focus upon the word and they cast the word behind their backs. No, oh, we don't need that. I'll just do what I want to do. And slew thy prophets. They didn't like anybody telling them the word. Don't tell me what to do. I don't want to hear that word. You know, they get mad about people who try to bring the word to them. You should always be correctable. You should always be ready to receive the word that people are bringing to you. Don't be one of those that's not correctable. And so was, they slew the prophets that testified against them to turn them to thee, and they brought great provocations. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. You see, God's a just God. You say, I wonder why some of these things have befallen me. Well, if you walk contrary to the ways of the Word of God, you walk in sin, you are going to be delivered into the hands of your enemies because God is a just God. Blessings come on those that obey, but curses will come on those that disobey. You and I must walk in line with His Word and put it first place. They vexed Him. But in time of their trouble, God's still there. He hadn't left. 
He cried, he heard them from heaven, according to their manifold mercies, gave them saviors, and saved them out of the hand of their enemies. God will be there for you, and he will bring you out. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 32. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 32. As you're walking your walk through the spiritual land, verse 10, it says, He found him in the desert land, in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Know what God's going to do. He's going to lead you. He's also going to instruct you. He's going to have to show you the right way to go. And he's going to keep you. He's going to keep you, guard you, and protect you if you will walk in his ways. You've got to follow. As he's leading you, you've got to follow his instruction. And the result will be God will keep you and protect you. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttering over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on their wings. God will be there to pick you up. The Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. You can't have any other gods, any other idols, anything else as a source. Once you start looking to something else as a source, then you just moved away from God, and you are giving place to him. At the same time, there was a great shaking that would come in the wilderness in Psalms 29, verse 8, it was his voice. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. And the Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. Kadesh means holy. He is shaking the wilderness that is to be a place where the holy ones are to learn his ways, learn his voice, and start to walk in his ways. He's going to shake the wilderness. See, everybody that's come out of Egypt, he's going to shake them in their life to find out whether they're going to listen to him, whether they're going to hear his voice, whether they're going to hearken to his voice, whether they're going to obey him and walk in his ways, or whether they're going to walk contrary. He shakes in the wilderness of, of, of Kadesh, the holy place, the place of holiness where he wants you to walk in. We see over in Numbers, chapter 32, there were those who didn't listen to God. They made critical mistakes. In Numbers 32, verse 9, they went up into the valley of Ishkol and saw the land. Remember the 12 spies that went out to search out the land? They all saw the land. Ten of them came back with an evil report, didn't they? And two came back with a good report. What did they do? The majority is discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. Well, we see a lot of people are discouraging people from entering into the land because they won't follow the way of the Lord. See, if you won't cast out the demons and get into the warfare and start doing what he says, how are you ever going to possess the land when you've got to drive the enemies out first before you can go in to possess it? And they would discourage the heart because the enemies are too much. People, some people don't want to take on their enemies. They want somebody else to fight their battle for them. Just get somebody to pray for me. People that always are asking somebody to pray for them, pray for them, pray for them, they basically don't want to fight their own battle. There's nothing wrong with getting other people to pray for you, but you better be praying too. They should be in agreement with you as you're engaging in the fight. But a lot of people, they want everybody to pray for them, but they won't pray for themselves. They won't engage in the fight. We find that's the problem in the body of Christ today. The prayer lines are jammed. People are calling prayer lines all over the country. Pray for me for this and pray for me. I always want to know, what are you praying for? Well, I'm calling you to pray for me. Well, how about you praying? How about you entering into the fight and doing the things? Because you're the one that has to work out your own salvation and destroy the enemies in your own life. The Lord's anger, anger was kindled against this at the same time, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt, from twenty years old upward, shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. These are the ones that came out of Egypt. He said, Why would they not see the land? They've not wholly followed me. What is God expecting? He's expecting you and I to wholly follow the Lord. That means we're going to hear and do his word. We're not going to just do our own thing whatsoever. Save Caleb, the son of Javani, and the Kenanite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. They had the testimony. They were the only two. They were the one that came and brought the good report, said, let us go up and possess it. We're well able. We're well able to go up and possess this land. The Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and made them wander in the wilderness 40 years into all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. You see, those who do not follow the Lord wholly, they're going to wander throughout their entire life, and they're going to end up dying out in the wilderness. They're never going to see the promises. 
They're going to see all these calamities and problems. They're going to have all these attacks from the serpents and scorpions and all the damage and all the destruction and can continue to have whirlwinds going on in their lifetime after time after time. God does not want you to have a whirlwind. He wants you to have peace and victory and possessing the promises of God in your life. He doesn't want you to have all this sickness beating you up. He wants you to have health. He doesn't want you to have all this turmoil going on in your mind. He wants you to have peace of mind. He doesn't want you to have all these financial problems and all this destruction. He wants you to have prosperity and blessing. That's the will of God of what he has for all of us. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 7. What was their problem? Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. Otherwise, we can't sit there and wonder, wonder why all this is happening. Well, there'd be a reason, wouldn't there? They were provoking the Lord to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until he came into this place, you've been rebellious against the Lord. That's a bad report. We know a lot of people that have got born again, but they've never submitted themselves to the Word of God. They keep on being resistant to God consistently throughout their life. They're never going to enter in. They're just going to wallow around in their same old problems. And until they come to the place of repentance, they're never going to come out of that bondage. That's why we've got to show them the fact that, hey, you've got to wholly follow the Lord if you think you're going to come out of bondage and enter into what God has for you. In Psalm 78, over in verse 17, it says, They sinned yet more and more against them by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. You have to realize every time you sin, you're actually provoking the Lord. God has set a way of righteousness. He wants you to walk in His ways. We, we sin against God. We, it's not a lot of people think, well, we know we're always going to sin. It's not a big deal. You know, we just confess our sin, but if I sin, you know, I know I'm going to do it. That's a wrong attitude. You should have a hatred for sin. You should be resisting sin, resisting steadfast, fighting against it. Hebrews 12.4, we've seen that scripture before. No, they sinned more and more, and they provoked the Most High in the wilderness. They tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Oh, they wanted what they wanted. You see, if you're going to follow the Lord, Luke 9.23 says, If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily, crucify on the flesh, and follow me. What's the first step? Deny yourself. That means you're not following your own lusts or strong desires. Well, that's what they were doing, and they were tempting God. You actually tempt God in your heart when you want to follow the lusts of the flesh. Yet they spake against God and said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? They were questioning his provision. Can God give me everything I need in the wilderness? You've got to understand, God will provide for you. It doesn't matter where you are. He will provide and meet your needs if you look to him. And, of course, he did that. He provided for them. We see down in verse 29. They did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. You know, God was still with them and he was merciful, because it does rain on the just and the unjust, remember. He'll still feed you. But they were not estranged from their lust. They continued in it. And while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. These guys were chosen, but they didn't do what he told them to do. You see, you can be following the Lord at one point, and those many are called, few are chosen, but you know, you're going to have to continue in that way and be faithful. Remember the ones that come back with Jesus in Revelation 17, 14 are those that are called, chosen, and faithful. Not just called only. Not just called and chosen. Called, chosen, and faithful. They continued in the way of the Lord. Well, these guys didn't. And they got smitten down before the Lord. In, chapter, in verse 40, he goes on and says, How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Why? Because they wouldn't obey him. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. You've got to realize, if we turn back and we don't do what he says, we're actually limiting God. Many people say, well, I thought God was God and he can do anything he wants. No. He's a performer of his word. You can't sit there and say, well, God can just do anything. These people think God's in control of all things out there and it doesn't matter what I do. God's just going to do whatever he wants to do. It's a lying teaching. The devil's out there, and you got a choice. He set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose. Whichever you choose is what you're going to get. Well, anytime they turned back and tempted God by not doing what he said, they actually limited him. You mean to tell me that I could limit and stop God from doing what he purposes in my life because of my choices? That's right. God's not holding anything back. Remember, it says he holds back nothing from those who walk uprightly before him. He's not withholding it back. 
In fact, he talks about in Jeremiah 5 that it's your sins, your iniquities that are withholding the good things from you. That's what's holding it back. Don't think for a minute. I wonder why God's not doing such and such. Hey, there's a reason. Verse 52. But he made his own people to go forth like sheep. Now, these are the ones that followed the right way. What do the sheep do? They're right on the heels of the shepherd, and they're listening to his voice, and they're obeying him and following him. And he guided them in the wilderness like a flock. God will guide you. He led them on safely. God will keep you in safely. Safe, safety in your life. So that they feared not. No fear. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. Yeah, the enemies are out there, but you rely on God. He's given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And your enemies, they will be smitten under your foot. And you don't have to be afraid of your enemies. People that are, have fear of the enemies really haven't come to trust in God. Fear is the opposite of faith. God's commanded us to walk by faith. Over in Psalms 95, we see further what happened to these guys. Verse 7, it says, He's our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice. Do you know today is every day of your life? Today, you hear His voice. Tomorrow will be today. We want to hear His voice and obey Him every day. Harden not your heart as in the provocation of the day of temptation in the wilderness. They harden their heart. If you don't obey His voice, you actually harden your heart, whether you realize it or not. Well, I don't want to harden my heart. I just want to do what I want to do. Too bad. You just harden your heart if you don't obey what He wants you to do. We've got to follow His way. When your fathers tempted me, prove me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. They never would come to walk in His ways. You know, it's amazing. There's Christians out there that have been just Christians forever, and they still haven't learned to walk in the ways of the Lord. They still keep doing their own thing. They still keep living by the flesh, doing what they want to do. Hey, we all got to come to repentance and turn around. We can't walk our own ways any longer. We got to walk in the ways of the Lord. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. Today, will we hear His voice and walk in His ways and be obedient to Him? He said, it's a people that do err in their heart, and they've not known my ways. You see, if you err in your heart, God's never going to reveal His ways to you. He reveals His ways to those whose heart is right before Him. He'll bring revelation to you. Unto whom I swear in my wrath, they should not enter into my rest. The rest was entering into the promise of land, promised land, which is you entering into the promises of God in your life. You want to enter into the promised land? We've got to be following His way. We're not going to be able to do it our own way. You got to understand there's three types of tests or temptations. One of them is God's testing man. Another is man's testing God. And the other is Satan is testing man. God's test is always to bless him, to find out what's in his heart, and to develop the personal relationship and increase him, instruct him, build him up, strengthen him, increase him in knowledge and understanding wisdom so he walks in the ways of the Lord. Satan's test is always to take the word out and destroy you, to steal, kill, and destroy, and bring some kind of destruction. And man's test is when he doesn't obey God and he limits God, shuts him off, hinders him, and actually give place to the devil so the devil can work in their life. We see over in Genesis chapter 22, in verse 1, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now when it talks about tempting, God does tempt or test or try to prove, it means, a lot of times we think of tempt just in a negative connotation, like being tempted with evil. Well, tempt is a good thing, or testing, when it's God doing it, because it's always, he never does things for evil, it's always for your good. But Satan will come to tempt for evil things. But it's really the same word it's talking about. So God did tempt or test or try Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll tell thee of. This is his only son, the son of promise, that he promised was going to, the seed was going to bring all this blessings through him, and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. He already had this promise given unto him. And now God is telling him to go up and offer him as a, a sacrifice on this thing. You know what? You've got to learn to trust God and obey what he told him to do. So he did. He obeyed. And he goes on, and we see in verse 5, he said to the young man, Abide you here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. That's confidence. Hey, I'm going to go sacrifice him, but he's coming back with me. Otherwise, essentially, he's going to raise him from the dead because I already got a promise from God. What God says is going to come to pass. 
He's going to be blessed, and not just in me, but in Isaac and through his seed. It's going to happen. Well, God's going to find out whether you're going to obey him in whatever area it is. Well, so he takes him up there. He puts him up there, uh, the, takes of the fire, the, the hand, the, uh, the knife, and the wood, and all of them up there. And his, even Isaac says, uh, where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And God said prophetically, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went, both of them together. Came to the place, Abraham builds the altar, puts the wood in order, binds Isaac his son, lays him on the wood, altar upon the wood. He stretched forth his hand. He took the knife to slay his son, to do what God said. And the angel of the Lord calls out of heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. God finds out whether you fear him in the measure that you obey him. If you will obey him, he knows you have the fear of God. You can't say, well, I have the fear of God before me, and then go and be disobedient. Now I know that you fear God, seeing you haven't even withheld, has not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And of course, he provided the ram, which was, of course, pointing towards Jesus was going to be the lamb who was going to be provided for us to take away the sin of the world. And then he called out the second time, and he said, my, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, in blessing I'll bless thee. What's the purpose of God in everything he tells you to do? It's always to bless you. To bless you and multiply, and I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. God's tests are always to do you good, to bring blessing. At the same time, he's going to find out what's in your heart, He's going to find out whether you really have the fear of God before him or not. And we saw that one in Psalms about, there are several places we'll be looking at later, not this morning, but later, in Psalm 78, over here in verse 41, which we saw, but just to bring it to your attention again. When man tests God, he limits the Holy One of Israel. When you test him, it's essentially you shut him down from working. God is not going to be able to work if we don't allow him to work in our life. He can't just do whatever he wants to do. So many people think, well, I wonder why God hasn't done this. There's a reason. He doesn't hold anything back. A lot of times it's a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowing what to do. But sometimes it can also be because we haven't obeyed him. Now, here's the devil. What does the devil come to do? This is one of the things he does. Luke 8, 12. By the, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. When the word is heard, it gets in your heart immediately, and the devil comes to try to take the word out. How can he take the word out if you don't do it? If you don't do the word, he takes the word out, and it's not there. Even though you may have knowledge of it mentally, the word's got to be in your heart, and that's going to produce the fruit in your life. So the devil is coming, and he's coming to bring destruction. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, we, see, we saw in Psalms 95, but we come down here in Hebrews chapter 3, we even see more that is spoken here. Hebrews chapter 3, in verse 7, he says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation of the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, I was grieved with the generation, and said they do always err in their heart, and they've not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Then he goes on and says, Take heed, brethren, that's for all of us, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. See, you can have evil in your heart. That's why we pointed out to you before that the spirit and the heart are different. The spirit is who you are on the inside. The heart is what is the hidden man or the inner man on the inside. And you've got to guard your heart. No evil will get in your spirit. It's getting in your heart. You know, a lot of people talk about, well, I've got to get the word in my spirit. You're not really getting the word in your spirit. You're getting the word in your heart. That's where the word is sown. The evil heart of unbelief. You get evil in your heart by allowing the enemy to come in in some way, in this way, be unbelief. You actually depart from the living God. He says, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. One of the things that has to be established in you as you are going through your spiritual wilderness I am going to stand against sin. I hate sin. I realize that when I sin, I am causing a hardening of my heart 
It is the deceitfulness of sin which is opening the door and giving place to the enemy and allowing evil spirits to come in and limiting God and shutting down His work and allowing the enemy to work in my life. And I'm hardening my heart from being yielded to Him as well. It takes a toll upon you. For we're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast in the end. You only become a partaker of Christ in the measure that you hear and do His word, see. He said, again, harden not your hearts. When some, when they heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, with whom was he grieved forty years, was not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. He was grieved. He's grieved. He still loves you, but he's grieved if we don't walk in his ways. By whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, because they believed not. We see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief. Anytime you don't do God's word, you're essentially in unbelief because you haven't believed him and carried it out in our life. And so they could not enter in. You've got to understand that the revelation, that, that uh, the wilderness is a revelation of God's dealings in your life to find out whether you're going to walk in his ways. And it's also a revelation of Satan's workings against you to try to bring destruction. And it also finds out who you're going to respond to and who you're going to obey and who you're going to resist. We find out our response of whether we're going to walk in his ways or not. Over in Psalms, Psalms 106, in the wilderness, verse 14, what happened to these guys? They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Again, anybody that's walking after the flesh, you are tempting God and shutting him down in your life. He gave them their request. God will give you your request. But he sent leanness into their soul. Your soul is where the battleground is, your will, intellect, and emotions. You'll be lean in your soul. You won't be strong in your soul. You won't have a fat soul. God wants you to have a fat soul that's strong, Amen. not a lean soul that you can be a, such a pushover in your will or in your emotions or in your mind and that you yield to the devil left and right. See, the stronger the word is in you, the stronger you get, the more you're going to be set in your will, your mind and emotions to choose the way of the Lord. Leanness came into their soul. Uh, we can't have a lean soul. Or we're going to be easy pickings for the devil. Over in Psalms 107, verse 4. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. You'll just wander around in your life and you'll never enter into the things God has. You'll never enter ever into the promises. You'll never enter into the ministry that God has for you and really grow and begin to flourish in the things of God. I've seen Christians wandering forever because they would not hear and do the Word. Hungry and thirsty. Why are they hungry and thirsty? Because they weren't feeding on what they should. You should be filling yourself up with the Word and hearing the Word and eating the Word daily. Otherwise, you're spiritually hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. Oh, when the tax come, their soul fainted. Have you had times when your soul fainted? You just didn't stand up the way you should have? You seemed to fall under the pressure? That's because your soul was not strong enough. Because you haven't got your fat soul yet. Remember, the Word is written in your heart, and it's also written in your mind. It'll produce that strength in you. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their distresses. One thing about God, though, He's always there. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. God is such a long-suffering God. If you make a mistake or you blow it, confess your sin, get on the right path, He's right there to forgive you. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He'll pick you up and He'll be right there to lead you in the right way. But don't let yourself continue in a wrong way or you are going to see destruction. You see, He's going to find out really what's in your heart. And it all comes down to, is the Word in there or not? You see, if you're not following the Word, you must be following something else. Hebrews 4.12 says the Word of God is quick or alive and powerful, which means active and operative, sh sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What are the thoughts and the intents of your heart? Because out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth's been speaking. Out of what's in your heart, the thoughts and the tense of your hearts of what's been directing you and guiding you and leading you and what you've been seeking after and going after. The wilderness reveals the motives of your heart. We want to be those that are going to walk in the ways of the Lord. What happens for those that walk in the ways of the Lord? They're going to enter in. They're going to possess the promises of God in their life. 
We see over here in Numbers 14, 24, remember talk about Caleb and Joshua? My servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, hath followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land where into he went, and his seed shall possess it. Following him fully. We see this again over in Joshua in chapter 14, down here in verse 10. He said, The Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And lo, now lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Forty-five years from the time of forty. Eighty-five years he is now. He's just as strong. He says, I'm as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. You're to maintain your spiritual strength at all times in your life. You should not diminish. In fact, you should be increasing in strength and abounding. My strength was then even as my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. You've got to understand, he was raised up to be a warrior, and you're going to stay being a warrior throughout your life. If you think you're just going to fight for a while and then retire to the sidelines and not have to fight anymore, you're kidding yourself. You're going to be fighting. You're going to be in a warfare. If you're not helping getting things out of you, you're going to be helping getting things out of someone else. You're going to be engaged in a warfare, and you're going to have to be ready to deal with all the enemies that would try to come against you. He goes on and says, Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake on that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out. When you're right with God and you're following them fully, God's with you. And you will be able to drive out your enemies. He blessed them and gave them Hebron for an inheritance. And he got the inheritance. Why? Because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. What is God doing? He is doing a work in you to bring you to the place of wholly following the Lord. That means all areas of sin have to be dealt with. All the things of the world have to be put away. All the things of the flesh have to be destroyed, put them all to death, and we are going to crucify that flesh daily and walk in His ways. Isaiah 40, verse 3, speaking of John the Baptist, prophetically it was about, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. God is wanting to come and manifest himself. What did they have to do? They had to make a straight way, straight way in the desert for the Lord to come. Well, what is that way? What's the straight way that he has for us? We see in Isaiah 35, 1, he said, The desert and the solitary place shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice in the blossom as the rose. Otherwise, this desert, parched area, is going to start blossoming. blossoming. It's going to start being fruitful. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Otherwise, God's glory is going to manifest and great things are going to happen. Strengthen you the weak hands. You've got to get strong. You think you're going to be weak and you're going to enter in to what God has? No, it takes spiritual strength. Confirm the feeble knees. They're to be strengthened. Say that I'm of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Who's your source? God. He's going to deliver you, heal you, set you free, bring you out of bondage in your life. You cannot have fear. You have fear, you're going to go into bondage. Remember what happened to Job? The thing that he feared came unto him. The thing that he greatly feared came upon him. Fear not, or you're an open door for the enemy. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Lame man will leap as a heart, tongue of the dumb will sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. In the midst of you walking in your walk, God's miracles are going to happen. His healings and deliverance and victory is going to happen, and you're going to see great things manifest in your life as you're going through your spiritual desert, spiritual wilderness going, pa passing through into the promised land. The parched ground shall become a pool. The thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Everything that's, n that's not fruitful is going to be turned around to be unfruitful. And a highway shall be there in a way. And what's the way that you've got to walk in? It's the way of holiness. There's no other way to enter into the promised land but by the way of holiness. The way of the flesh will always bring destruction. The way of the world will never make it. One foot in the world, one foot in God. One foot in the flesh, one foot in the God, way of the Spirit, that produces lukewarmness. You'll never enter in. The way of holiness is the way in order to enter into what God has. The unclean shall not pass over. Anything that's unclean has got to be eliminated out of our life. You're not going to pass in with uncleanness into the promised land. 
It shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. He says, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereupon. That's a type of the evil spirits. They're to be all cast out. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. You're the redeemed. You're the purchased. You're to walk that walk, the holy walk, the way of holiness. The ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion. Zion is a type of the conquering church that's come up in the mount, having overcome all the enemies with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. Why will sorrow and sign flee away? Because you got the victory. you got peace. you got hell. You've conquered every enemy in your life. There's no reason for sorrow and sign, because every enemy's been put underfoot. And you're just full of joy and gladness and rejoicing because of what the Lord has done, as you have walked the walk and seen God bring forth victory in your life. Praise God. we got to walk that walk. You know, Jesus was the forerunner, remember, for us. And Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That's right. He was taken in the wilderness because he had to be tested. Remember, he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He had to be tested, and you and I are going to be tested as well. You are in your spiritual wilderness to see whether you're going to walk in his ways or not. Forty days, number of testing, tempt of the devil. In those days he did eat nothing. Or were hung, after he entered, he was hungered. And so here's the devil coming with his temptations. If you be the Son of God, command the stone to be made bread. What's the answer to every temptation of the enemy? It's always the word. If you don't know the word, how are you going to be able to defeat the temptations? You won't. The devil will come against you in areas especially where you don't know the word because he knows you can't resist him, so you're not going to get the victory. You've got to know the word. It takes spiritual power against the spiritual enemy to deal with things. Mind over matter, flesh over against the demons, you're not going to be able to prevail. Paul tried to deal with things in the flesh when all these enemies were coming against him and the enemy pummeled him. It wasn't until he learned how to operate in the authority and the power of God and the spirit that he conquered the enemy that instead of getting beat up on his missionary journey, he turned the tables and started destroying the works of the enemy. So important. See, you're going to live by every word of, and you're going to speak the word to extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked one. He takes them up, shows them all the kings of the world, and then, of course, tells them all these things will be for you. And he says, just fall down and worship me. All be thine. What's the answer? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It's written. You've got to know the word to deal with all these temptations. The same thing happened the next time. He tried to get him to cast himself down to prove such that he was who he was. And the devil even knows scripture. He'll give his angels charge over you to keep thee. And their hands will bear thee up, lest any time they dash the foot against a stone. The devil can even try to twist scripture to deceive you. That's why you've got to know the words so you aren't deceived. He said it's written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when he came and he got, came back, the devil ended all the temptation. He departed from him for a season. Notice, if you think, oh, I covered, got rid of the temptations, uh, now it's going to be smooth sailing. No, it just said for a season, season. As long as you're in this world, you will be tempted. The devil will try to find your weak areas. He'll try to set you up any way possible. You always got to be on guard. That's why it says watch and pray so you don't enter into the temptation. You've got to always be on guard so you don't give place to the enemy. And notice, he returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. You want to ha have the power of the Spirit? It's going to be in the measure that you've conquered the temptations. If you didn't conquer the temptations, how are you going to have the power of God manifest? No, instead you're going to be weak. He returned in the power of the Spirit because he had conquered the temptations, and he also, of course, had been fasting, and here the Spirit of God and the Word of God and all the works of God. He passed all the tests of the temptations, and the power of God was working in him because that's how you're going to destroy the enemies. As you overcome all the temptations with the power of God through the Word that we're to live by, you know, we're to live by the power of God. That's why you need to read that book about how we need to live by the power of God. A very important message. You're going to get full of the power of God, and you're going to manifest the power of God in your life. Praise God. In Ezekiel, go back over in the Old Testament, we see in the wilderness, Ezekiel chapter 34, he says over here in verse 25, I will make them a covenant of peace. God's got a covenant of peace. And will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. That's all the devils are to be eliminated out of you. They shall dwell safely in the wilderness, 
and sleep in the woods. You are going to be safe as you are going towards the promised land. Now, if you let these devils continue to stay in you and you don't deal with them, you're going to be out there in the wilderness and you're going to be out there where the enemy can work. Remember the man from Gadara who had all of these evil spirits in him, the legion of demons? That's what it says. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out, and for oftentimes it had caught him, and it was kept, kept, he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands, and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Hey, we're abiding in the wilderness if we're letting these evil spirits stay in us. That's why we've got to cast out all the demons. You cast all the demons, you're actually getting the enemies out of you. Remember, the serpents and scorpions are in the wilderness, and we've got to clean house and drive them out. So as you're bound by the enemy, he's actually the devil's driven you out on the wilderness instead of going in to possess the promises of God in your life. And what did it do? It tormented the guy. He was tormented. We don't want to be tormented. If you're tormented in any area, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, socially, whatever it might be, that's a work of the devil. We cannot allow that. We've got to cast these devils out and get free. That's why you've got to get involved in deliverance. Joshua 5, verse 6. The children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war, notice, they were trained up as men of war. You know, most of the body of Christ doesn't even realize that they're supposed to be men and women of war. But even the ones who are men and realize, and they've been trained up to be men of war because they've learned about spiritual warfare that came out of Egypt, meaning they were born again, they still got consumed. Why? Just because you've been trained up something, taught, to be a man or woman of war doesn't mean that you're going to not necessarily get consumed. Why did they get consumed? Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. If you don't obey the voice of the Lord and start attacking these enemies and dealing with the sin and come out of all bondage and clean house and cast out all these spirits, you could be trained up and taught as men of war, but get consumed. We've got to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Otherwise, we're going to have a great fall and we're not going to see the victory come forth in our life. Well, we see over in Ezekiel, again, Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, we see it down here in verse 13. What was the problem here? The house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. What showed they rebelled? They didn't walk in his statutes. They despised his judgments. What if a man do? He shall even live in them. They, they wouldn't do what he wanted them to do. And what was the result? He poured out his fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. God is a God of judgment as well as a God who of, of love and a God of righteous and a God who is holy. And he is a God who will perform his judgment if we will not walk in his ways. Verse 16, they despise my judgments. They walk not in my statutes, polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. Oh, their hearts start going after other things. Your heart has always got to go after the Lord and walk in his ways. There's another scripture that shows the fact that, wow, we really need to develop this trust in the Lord. And you're going to come to the place of walking in victory. In Jeremiah 17, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. You trust in man? You trust in other men? You trust in yourself? You're going to be in trouble. He makes the flesh his arm. I can handle it myself. No whose heart departs from the Lord. If you keep trying to deal with things in your own ability, you're never going to get anywhere. For he shall be like the heath of the desert. He won't even see when good cometh. But he'll inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and a salt land and not inhabited. He's abiding out there in the desert. No fruit. He's got all these problems. Getting nowhere. All these problems are occurring in his life. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. This is the guy who's got his eyes on the Lord. He's hearing and doing his word consistently. What's he going to be like? He'll be like as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh. He didn't even see when it comes because it's not going to come nigh him because you're going to be protected, see. It's not even going to phase you. It's not even going to affect you because you're going to do the word. Her leaf shall be green, shall not be careful in the year of drought. doesn't matter what's going on in the natural. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Fruitfulness will come forth continually in your life. What's the key? You've got to have yourself right with the Lord. That is the key. Now, if you just go through the motions, and there's a lot of Christians out there that just kind of go through the motions. You know, they're, trying, they're, they're, doing, 
things from a standpoint of, oh, I do it because I should do it and ought to do it. But there's problems. Amos 5.25, if you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, oh, oh house of Israel, you ask him, have you done this? But you've borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Shion, your image is a star of your God, which you made to yourselves. Therefore, I'll cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord. In other words, they were doing two things. They were offering up their sacrifices like they were following all these good things. But they also had an idol over here on the side. No. You can't have anything that's not of God. What's going to happen? They ended up going into captivity in their life. Malachi chapter 3 in verse 1. He says, Behold, I will send my messenger. Who's that? That's Jesus for us today. And he shall prepare the way before me. This is talking about John the Baptist initially, but the messenger is coming to us today as Jesus is coming in the church. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come. Suddenly come to his temple. Not for his temple. To his temple. Who's the temple? You and I are. The Lord's coming to the temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he'll come, saith the Lord of hosts. What's he coming to do? He's coming to purge us, refine us, find out if we're going to be right with him. Who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? He's like a refiner's fire that's going to try you and test you. And like the fooler's soap. For you who are here on Wednesday, we talked about the fooler's field. And how you've got to go down to the fooler's field to be washed and cleansed of every evil. And when you're in the fooler's field, the enemy will not be able to come against you successfully. The Lord will fight for you and smite your enemies to clean you up. He's going to clean you up and he's going to test you. And he's going to bring you to the place of walking in the way of the Lord. He goes on and says, He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he'll purify the sons of Levi. That's the priests which is you and me today. And he'll purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. What are we to be? We're to be an offering to the Lord in righteousness, because we do righteousness. He's going to refine you. He's going to purify you. He's going to purge you. If you will not allow the purging, refining, and purifying process to come forth, are you ever going to be an offering of righteousness? No. Instead, you'll be wallowing out there in the wilderness, wondering why things aren't working in my life. Well, I thought God was supposed to do this. I thought God was in control of all things. I'm just waiting on the Lord to do such and such. That's what I hear people saying all the time. And I'm wondering, what are you doing of the Word of God to release Him and to put Him in operation? What am I doing? You're to be doing the Word that puts Him in operation, see? Isaiah 43, 18. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Have you had a lot of destructive things? Don't get your focus on them. Get your focus on the Lord. He goes on and says, Behold, I'll do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and the rivers and the desert. Maybe you've had a lot of destruction. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. He'll make a new way. He'll make a way where there seems no way. He'll make a way. It's the way of the Spirit, the way of blessing, the way of victory, the way of peace, the way of health. He'll show you the way to walk in, and he'll say, Walk in that way. And he's going to bring forth great things, rivers in the desert are going to manifest in your life and you are going to see God do great things. We even see down in chapter 51 and verse 1, he says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. That's, the, that's our job. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, into the hole of the pit whence you are digged. Look unto Abraham your father and to Sarah that bear you where I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. He said, For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he shall comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden, like the Garden of Eden. There wasn't any evil going on there. It was nothing but fruit and good things. Her desert like the Garden of the Lord. You're to become the Garden of the Lord. You're to be full of all these fruits of righteousness and all the blessings of God coming on you and overtaking you. Joy and gladness will be found there. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. That's what God wants. In fact, when you walk in the way of the Lord and you pass his tests, you won't even stumble. In Isaiah 63, 12, it says, He led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. 
that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. God doesn't want you to stumble. We're not to stumble. We're to walk the straight and narrow way, and we're to walk on the highway of victory. And he's going to bring that to pass. Hallelujah. You are to be a fruitful field. We see another scripture in Isaiah in chapter 32 where it says what's going to happen for those who pass the test and those who are going to be not passing the test. He says in verse 15, Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. You know, we talked about in 1 Peter 4, 17, that the time has come that judgment must come to the house of God, which is the church. And it's coming to us first. Well, what's going to happen? There's going to be a fruitful field that's going to come for those who are walking in the way of righteousness. Judgment's going to come for those that are dwelling in the wilderness. They're going to be in trouble. Remember, we're not dwelling in the wilderness. We're going through the wilderness, showing the fact that we're passing the tests. We're developing the character of the Lord. We're walking in His ways. We have a heart that's right before Him. We're hearing and doing His Word. We're flourishing. We're seeing all this fruit and all this blessing come forth in our life. Righteousness will remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness, as you're doing righteousness, shall be peace. You're going to have peace. And the effect of righteousness, the effect of that work, will be quietness and assurance forever. That's for a long time. And my people shall dwell in peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. That is what God has for you and for me. That is what he's bringing us through as we pass the test. In Ezekiel chapter 37, we see something very important. In verse 3, he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Here's the bones out there in the wilderness, the dry bones. And I answered, Lord, Lord God, thou knowest. He said to me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. The dry bones are all of us. What's the answer? Hear the word of the Lord. You've got to hear the word of God if you're going to come out of being a dry bone. If you're going to be one that's thirsty and hungry and a lean soul and out there in the way of bondage and being up there where on the wilderness with all the serpents and scorpions beating you up left and right and hindering you. Hear the word of the Lord. You've got to hear God's word. Thus saith the Lord God in these bones, Behold, I'll cause breath, that spirit, to enter into you and you'll live. What happens? God's word is spirit and life. John 6, 63. When God's word comes into you, it not only brings life, but it brings spirit into you. And you're going to walk in the spirit by the word of God. And his word coming into you is going to do a great work. And he goes on here as we see. He's talking about how this bones, he said, the, it's going to bring the flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you, you'll live, you'll know that I am the Lord your God. So I prophesied as I was commanded, I prophesied, and there was a noise. You see, as this word is coming, and spirit and life is coming into this body that was dead, that wasn't walking right. Behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. This is what God is doing. He's shaking everything that can be shaken in these last days. And he is bringing forth and raising up a body of believers who are going to be the army of the Lord. Bone to bone, the body of Christ is coming together. When beheld, the sinews and the flesh came upon it, and the skin covered them above. There was no breath in them. He said, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy. Come from the war four winds, O breath, breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesy as he commanded me. The breath came into them. They lived and stood upon their feet. An exceeding great army, the Spirit of God, at work in a believer. And how does the, what's the Holy Spirit come to do? He's a performer of the Word. How are you going to see the Spirit of God working mighty in your life as you hear and do the Word and you get filled up with the Spirit through prayer and praise and worship and praying in tongues and you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, to lead you, to guide you, to direct you and so forth in your life. Exceeding great army. And he says, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we're cut off for our parts. Prophesy to them, behold, O my people, I'll open your graves, cause you to come out of your graves, bring you into the land of Israel, as you shall know that I am the Lord, which I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of the graves. 
and I'll put my spirit in. You'll live, and you'll place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it, saith the Lord. God is going to raise up the body of Christ that are going to receive his word and the working of the Holy Spirit, and life is going to come into you. It's going to come through the word of God. And as you hear and do it, you're going to be raised up, and you're going to become mighty before the Lord. And so he's going to take the, the body of Christ, he's going to cause it to become a mighty army of the Lord. The mighty army, that is what he's going to raise up. But you've got to pass the tests. The wilderness' purpose is to come, remember, to humble you, to find out what's in your heart, to find out whether you're going to walk in the fear of the Lord, to find out whether you're going to be obedient to his word, do his law or not to teach you how to confront the enemy and conquer the enemy in your life, to teach you how to live by the Word. We live by the Word of God in everything we do. To find out what's in your heart, what kind of motives, what kind of intentions do you have, where is really your heart with you, and to prepare you for the ministry of the Lord and raise you up to be a mighty army for the Lord. And you're going to conquer all your enemies. You're going to put every one of them underfoot. You're going to see the wilderness is going to be like a fruitful field because you're walking in righteousness. You're going to see that the wilderness is now going to become like the Garden of Eden, and you'll get to the place where the enemy, whatever comes at you, heat comes, it doesn't even phase you, because you have the blessings of God. The rivers are working. The fruitfulness is coming forth. You are strong in the Lord. You are mighty. You do not have any fear. You're possessing the promises of God, because you have passed the tests. How are you going to pass the tests? It all depends upon what you do with the Word of God. God is testing you, proving you, and preparing you in your spiritual wilderness as you're heading towards possessing the promised land. What are you going to do with His Word? And what are you going to do with everything that He tells us to do? If you will follow what He says and obey Him, you will see His results come forth in your life. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you that I am born again. I've come out of Satan's authority, out of Pharaoh's domination. I'm no longer of the world. I've come out of Egypt. I am now going through the spiritual wilderness to enter into the promises of God, the promised land. I thank you that you are leading me through the wilderness, not to abide in it, but to go through it, to possess the land. It is a time of testing and preparation. I will pass the tests. I thank you that you're humbling me and you're finding out what's in my heart and whether I'll walk in line with your word. I make my decision. I am walking in line with the word. I'm going to live by the word of God and I'm going to conquer all the serpents and scorpions. Every devil will be cast out and be put underfoot. I thank you that you are humbling me. You are proving me. You've come to do me good. I thank you, Lord, that I am going to triumph in all areas of life. I'm going to hear your voice. I'm going to conquer sin. I'm going to be guided by you. I will not resist you. I will not harden my heart, but I will obey your voice. I will deny the flesh. I'm not going to have a lean soul. I'm going to have a fat soul. And I'm going to walk in your ways. I know you, you find out the real thoughts and intents of my heart. But I am following your way. And your way is a straight way in the wilderness, the highway of holiness. I am walking in the ways of holiness, and I will be hearers and doers of your word. I will not disobey, or I will be consumed. I will not rebel, or I will be devoured by the enemies. I will not trust in the flesh or in my own ability, but I will trust in the Lord, and I will walk in the ways of victory. Thank you that you're refining me. You're cleaning me up. You're purifying me. And I thank you that you're making a way 
where there may seem to be no way. Because I'm following you. I thank you, Lord. My wilderness is becoming like Eden. It's becoming like the garden of the Lord. And I am going to see victory and great fruitfulness because I am walking in righteousness. And I will have peace and quietness and assurance forever. Thank you, Lord, because I wholly follow the Lord. I'm not going to be in the wilderness. I'm entering into the promised land. Thank you, Lord. I am going forth in obedience, and you will bring me into the promised land. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Very important you understand. Many people thought the wilderness is a place where, you know, I'm just supposed to, where people get destroyed and all these kind of things. No, the wilderness is a place of testing and proving to show whether you're going to walk in His ways. We're all going through the wilderness. Now, maybe you're dealing with a lot of situations in your life right now. What's going to be the answer? Get your eyes on Jesus. Get the Word of God. Start praying the Word of God, which is the answer to start releasing God's power. Start taking dominion over the enemy. Use your authority and get rid of the enemies that are, that are vexing you, that are hindering you, that are causing sickness in you, that are causing problems in your mind, in your soul, whatever it might be. Get into the warfare mode. God's raised you up as a man and a woman of war. And he wants you to get in there and start fighting that fight. Don't be one of those that knows the, you're a man of war, but you get consumed because you don't obey him. You're going to fight with the sword of the Spirit. Your mouth is what you're going to war with. And you're going to triumph over all your enemies. And God is going to bring the victory if you wholly follow the Lord your God. Be a doer, and you'll see God bring great things in your life. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of your word, and we're going through the spiritual wilderness to enter the promised land, and we shall possess all of our promises. And thank you, Lord. There'll be much fruit because we hear and do your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.